Welcome to the Time Scales Interviews. I'm Grego, your host. Today we have two very special guests, the extraordinary Vanessa, Vanessa Yule and Matthew Jacobs. Matthew is globally famous for the Doctor Who TV film, which was set right smack here in San Francisco. These two talents have just released a documentary film, which is titled Doctor Who Am I? And thanks to their generosity, you are just about to learn why this new film belongs in your DVD collection and on your screen today or as soon as possible. Ms. Yule and Mr. Jacobs, thank you for being here today. And it appears as if we're all in California. Ms. Yes. Ms. Yule, you're in California? Yeah. Mr. We're Jacobs? Yeah. We're both oh. in uh, Los, Angeles. Los Angeles. Okay. Uh, Sausalito here uh, by San Francisco, just across from the Bay. Uh, and uh, I've never interviewed uh, Doctor Who people in California before. In fact, I've only interviewed one other person in the United States, uh, my friend Alex Patterson, that's also a YouTuber uh, over on the East Coast. So this this is really cool. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. Now, here here's the new DVD that, that we're going to be talking about here, Doctor right. Who Am I? Uh, yeah. And um, I've seen this film, and I loved it. And right after I watched it, um, I'm okay. There we go. Vanessa's got a couple of them there too. Imagine that. Oh, here, let's show the back. Yeah, there we go. Uh, also, right. yeah, <laughs> that's the that's the UK edition that will be yes new stuff coming from Gravitas March twenty eighth um, in the in America. So. New stuff from Gravitas. Yes. Yeah, we... you bought it through UK Amazon. Yeah, um, exactly. And people can get yeah. region free. Blu-rays from UK Amazon, um, okay. but on March 28th it has its American release, where it'll be available on uh, Amazon here, and 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 there'll be a, a Region One DVD, and there'll be a re, you know, and there'll be a, a Region I would imagine Region Three um, Blu-ray, but that'll be made by Gravitas here. So it'll, and sorry. it'll be available on iTunes and Apple TV. Yeah, and you'll be probably, able to pre-book. Yeah. Yeah, and probably Amazon for digital download oh, on nice. March 28th. Yeah. Okay. And if you're in Boston, you know, we're in the Boston Film uh, Sci-Fi Film Festival on the 15th of February. We're in, and then on the 17th of February, we're playing at Gallifrey, the convention in Los Angeles. And then we're okay. at Beloit International Film Festival. We're not sure when. And then there'll be a couple of other festivals, we hope, but those haven't been confirmed yet. Okay. And then if you're in the UK, we're also available on BritBox. Yeah. Yep. I saw that yesterday. Um, yeah. Okay. So it's wow. All happening. And we're still okay. in the charts in, in the UK. You know, we're still in the documentary charts, number five. So people are, people are actually buying this thing. I was so glad nice. that you got to see it, Greg. It's yeah, and Vanessa, th th for thank you. For, yeah, thank you for sending me the the screener. I was oh, able to great. stream it thanks to her because this DVD just arrived from England uh, yesterday, oh. so um, that's why it still has the shrink wrap on it. So <laughs> you know what? Uh, I I'm trying I'm trying to decide: do I take the shrink wrap off hmm. and watch it again, or do I keep it like this on my shelf? And I I, I I think I'm going to open it and watch it again because it, it, it's, it, it is absolute. In fact, here's what I said about it. Um, at, right after watching it, uh, I used up all of the maximum characters possible on Twitter. Uh, and this is what I said. I just watched this Doctor Who Am I? And I am almost speechlessly floored. It is heart tugging and warming, shocking, funny enlightening, historic, rare, masterful, entertaining, educational, and so much California, a must see. And yes, you can fit that much stuff in one tweet. And here's something I just realized this morning on the back right here, it says heartwarming. I didn't realize that. So, Guardians so, that, so yeah. th this is true. I can confirm. <laughs> so, um, now, it, am I just exaggerating or was I overly excited when, after I saw this? Because that is really how I felt after seeing it. I, honestly, I don't know. I saw that and I was just like, oh my gosh, he, 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 this is so <laughs> lovely it. and amazing. Um, I, I mean, it is, 
we've been getting, you know, people are, are, are moved. I think they're surprised mm -hmm. people who see it. Um, they're expecting something just about Dr. Who is just like a documentary on fandom, but it's an actual story. And yeah. there is a, you know, a beginning, middle and an end, a three X structure. And it is about following Matthew Jacobs and his journey kind of from being not a fan to becoming a fan or it's also about realizing the power of of fandom and community and finding your your family with these group of people who love what you love just as much mm -hmm. as you do okay all right um now the first question this morning is for vanessa um when viewing the film it gave me the the impression that you're the one responsible for it and it seems to me that you are the driving force, motivation, or the uh, the engine, so to speak, that uh, that brought this uh, beautiful work to life. Um, am I correct in that? Well, Matt, is it, it, we co-directed and co-produced. Okay. Um, I edited the feature. It's uh, it's it's my first you know feature film, but certain. I mean, I mean, sure. But oh, <laughs> you, you don't mind that? Go for it. <laughs> sure. Go for um, it. It's all you. <laughs> but I mean, in terms of um, Matthew was definitely reluctant to go back into yes, this true. fandom. I mean, that was a genuine concern um, because, uh, you know, uh, the t he wrote the TV movie, The Eighth Doctor, it, for those who don't know, well, I guess a lot of people are Doctor Who fans who who listen to this. But um, so the notorious TV movie Matthew wrote, and um, I knew I had never seen it. I didn't know it existed. And uh, so when Matthew was describing the fact that, oh, no, the doctor was half human and that the doctor kisses people and that made people go crazy and like there was you know some people very angry at him i thought that was hilarious um me too <laughs> so <laughs> so that was sort of the premise and then matthew was like oh yeah i guess that could be funny okay okay we'll do this <laughs> and so there was this element of you know uh reluctance and even a reluctance of having it really be as much about him as it is but you know, through the editing and the years that it's taken us to to finish it, I mean, he's, you know, realized that the story um, really is within it, kind of his journey. And so that's how we we pin this story of fandom is through Matthew's genuine experience um, of sort of realizing what family our, he's part of. I think it, yeah, I think it's our experience, our journey. I mean, well, we're a duo, you know, I mean, I think that's why you picked up on that, Greg. You mm -hmm. get the feeling that that it's almost like, you know, in a way, Vanessa's the doctor, in a way I might be the companion, or I might be the doctor and she might be the companion. We're in a little blue mini driving around, you know, mm -hmm. America, talking to fans and going to conventions and, and having this weird little journey um, into fandom, basically. Yeah, the driving scenes in the mini were so beautiful. That, that's <laughs> did, did you guys use drones? For any of the footage? Yes, we did. Okay, yeah. that's what I thought. You yeah. have to. It's a documentary. Right. Yeah. right. We, we filmed but, that yeah. later. We were just kind of like, we need some drone shots. Yeah. We yeah. Need to, right. like, was, get out of the convention halls. We need some drone shots. We need yeah. to open this up a bit. So we got this great drone. Our DP, Dylan Glockler, who's always worked with Vanessa on previous documentaries as well, and on, on our previous feature films. Um, he had this wonderful drone and he got, got up there and, there and there's this wonderful bit in the rush where, the, where I think it's being attacked by a bird. Oh, there's a right. bird that comes that's closer. Really? What are you doing up here? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's trying to follow us in that car. We had such a, basically you're looking at American Anorak, which is our company. It's the two of us. Okay. So that's it. That's it. This okay. is truly an independent film. Yeah. Yeah, we got yeah, some yeah. crowdfunding and Vanessa's funded, and, you know, and so it's, 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 we, we put it together and because it was a success at Sci-Fi London last May, um, uh, it, 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 and won the audience award there, Kaleidoscope picked it up and then we've been playing festivals and we've been getting nice reviews and we've been, and then we got 
of grav of gravitas. You know, so it's, it's been finding its audience gradually over the year. And this is the year it really comes out in America. Okay. Okay. Very good. Um, and I would imagine that the streaming is even is going to add even more to the audience. Um, yes, because yeah, you know, back in 96, when the, uh, the, the, uh, television movie was only available on VHS, right. um, I can only imagine, uh, how much it could have spread more, more had we had the bandwidth on the internet to even stream back then, because those were the modem days, uh, yeah. back, back when the original Dial movie up. came out. Yeah, dial up. Uh, I was, you know, <laughs> perfect. I was going to try to do that. Sound you. you just nailed it. <laughs> okay, so um, Vanessa, tell us about yourself. Who are you? Um, you know, where do you come from? What do you enjoy? Well, um, I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And um, I also lived in New York City, San Francisco, and now I'm in LA. Um, yeah, I guess I, I, I've, I've had many different careers, I suppose. But um, like I, my undergrad, I studied astronomy. Um, and then I was sort of doing some acting. But then really, it's been filmmaking and being behind the screen where I found my kind of home. Um, I went back to film school to do because I really wanted to tell a documentary about kind of my own family. Um, uh, but it's very different from Doctor Who um, mm -hmm. about the Japanese American incarceration from World War II because my mom was born on a camp. And so I went back to film school really to just tell a story about myself or learn more about myself and my family history. And this, you know, chapter in America, you know, it's something that was very personally driven. And then, so from that, I did a, my thesis, which is an American contradiction, which you can still see on, 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 uh, online. Um, but then I've teamed up with Matthew, who was one of my uh, teachers in, in film school. And from there, I mean, he, I took my screenwriting with him in a directing class and immediately I like hit it, we hit it off. He's one of the funniest people I know. <laughs> and um, then I just started working with him on a couple of his feature films, um, which were in the vein of sort of like indie filmmaking and stuff like that. And um, that those were just enjoyable and fun experiences. I'm sure Matthew will, will talk more on those. Okay. Um, and then it was really, I mean, Doctor Who Am I has taken up <laughs> um several years um and so in between finishing this i've been you know doing commercial editing and and that sort of thing but this has really been the driving force and uh neither of us knew that it would take over seven years to finish oh it's wow truly an independent film and wow. so it's really been my like phd i suppose then yeah. okay. in learning okay. about yeah. filmmaking and story and just just trying to get an indie film out there yeah that um, by itself is massive yes so we've, been, we've both been learning so much since may of last year the process of getting an indie film in front of people um uh, is is fascinating especially even when you, these days yeah mm -hmm. even when you try to convince them there are millions of doctor who fans there is an like a core audience even then it was still like an uphill battle and just willpower and the friendship and whatever to just keep going and yeah. to get where we are so we're just okay. thrilled that american audiences will be able to see this Truly. yeah yeah and and they definitely need to it's it, it it is an extremely important piece of doctor who history as a whole um and oh. fact uh go ahead oh i just wanted to say i was always a science fiction fan so th okay. that was my only other thing about i love science fiction science that sort of thing all right that's it. okay <laughs> and i was going to tell you i'd like to see your thesis my wife is japanese okay. and uh so our daughters are half japanese half american and uh, we're we're taking them to Japan for all of next month. Uh, oh wow! That way they can meet their grandparents and learn about their their Japanese heritage. You have okay. to see American Contradiction. Yeah, it's, it's online. Really I good. can send. I'm it's going online. to. Yeah. Called an American American an American Contradiction. You know, there was recently a good Doctor Who episode, by the way. Oh yeah, yeah. somebody, somebody suggested, suggested that. that. 
long. Really? Yeah, they said. The, how bad it, it was. It, it was Long Island, wasn't it? Or was it Chicago? I can't remember. We were in Long Island, uh, TARDIS, and someone said that an episode on the Japanese American incarceration would be a really good episode, like yeah. for the doctor to go back and, you know, maybe he goes to Manzanar. I, well, I want him to go to Heart Mountain, but, you know, I'm like, oh, that mm. would be a really good episode. So, you know, you, put that out know, there to the BBC. I don't know. You, as far as I know, um, the uh, there has only been two Doctor Who stories where the doctor visited Japan. Um, so uh, as, as far as visiting Japan, but I would like to see a Doctor Who episode where the doctor visits California during the incarceration period. Yeah. And, yes, you know, be th there was a uh, recently there was a uh, an exhibit at the uh, Sacramento Museum of Art, um, which was focused just on that time period and oh, and nice. what all happened right there. Well, and we on the island. It's right close to you. You know, you're in San Salido, mm -hmm. you know, isn't mm -hmm. it? Isn't it Angel Island? Is it Angel Island? Angel Island, yep, yeah, exactly. Where the, where the intern um, camp was. And, and uh, yes, and I, I mean, one of the interesting things about the documentary is the documentary is actually sort of set in San Francisco. That's where mm -hmm. I am at the beginning. And, and it's very much, San Francisco has always figured in, um, in you know, and, and the reason the, the TV movie is set in San Francisco is because I was living in San Francisco at the time. It really? It was that simple. Um, okay. And, uh, and, uh, and um, I, the thing I love about Doctor Who is that you can deal with historical things and, and, and um, the internment was, it, I mean, you, people should just reach out and grab, um, go and see um, or online see uh, an American contradiction. An American contradiction. Yeah. Okay. And it's and it's shot by the same, you know, Vanessa and Dylan Glockler were a team before I met them. They had already been shooting. Um, okay. Yeah. Like so that's an interesting thing. thing. It's kind of like you'd see uh, you, there's Dylan, who, yeah, the DP and I were working together. If you want to see a whole thing of like before Doctor Who Am I, there's American contradiction. And then I almost, we both think that Matthew's, um, then we worked on Your Good Friend, which was a math, Matthew's film, and I kind of so was mock you, the... Your Good Friend, you can get it on Tubi, T-U-B-I, um, and Mubi or whatever. There's a, there are these various channels which have commercials, but 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 you can watch it there. You can watch it. It's it's called Your Good Friend, and it's a mock you docu drama, um, and it's about um, a friendship between. Um, a recently widowed rabbi and a washed up pornographer. And oh, well, okay. I, I play the pornographer set in oh. San Francisco. <laughs> um, and, and the rabbi plays the rabbi, it's played by Lawrence Cushman. And Vanessa um, plays and is the first assistant director who's making the documentary, the documentary. In the movie. Like in oh, the movie. Okay. <laughs> That's called a mock you That's confusing. <laughs> because right. so so that, everything turns in on itself. And there's a kind of a journey of friendship. It's about friendship, your good friend. And in a way, it's a prototype for, um, for Doctor Who Am I, which is really? also a journey of friendship um, in a way. So so they, they, do, they are a good, they're a good pairing, and they're both very, they both very much were born in San Francisco. Beautiful. Um, so okay, it's worth it. that is awesome. I have really learned something today, and imagine actually learning something when you're interviewing somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you, should, guess you probably should, huh? Um, that is fascinating, uh, Vanessa. Thank you very much for sharing that, and and uh, I do have something I believe I'm going to try to watch this evening. Uh, an okay. American contradiction, and I'm I'm looking forward to that. Um, now, uh, let's see here. Where are we, Vanessa? Your work on this film uh, as the co-director and the editor shows a massive amount of talent and love. It it, it comes through the screen. Um, what is your educational background in uh, film direction, production, and editing? Well, uh, well, my undergraduate was in astronomy. Right. Um, but then, so 
basically I studied directing at Academy of, of Art in San Francisco. Oh, nice. um, and, but really <laughs> it was just realizing there that I could do editing and that's, you know, you move to LA and you're like, I'm going to make my, I'm going to, I'm just going to make my directing, get jobs doing that. It's like, oh no, you need to find what your, your skill set is. And I realized that it was in editing. And so, I mean, my background, yes, was at the Academy of Art, but it's all knowing the right people and knowing like getting in with the community of filmmakers or get you know i mean working with matthew on his two features i also learned a lot from that and i learned so much from making this documentary it was editing a feature was definitely uh very tough when you've never done it before i mean uh, and so breaking, once you're presented with these hours and hours of footage, it's a bit overwhelming. You're like, where do I even start? Mm -hmm. And so I was in the beginning, we were just breaking things down and into little vignettes and stories, just following our characters. Um, and, and then eventually, you know, and that's where it was like really emerging in the edit room about how Matthew would have to be a, a main part of this story. Um, and Matthew being a screenwriter was extremely helpful because um, learning the, the three act structure and knowing kind of like, how do we set up this character? What is the midpoint? What is the central question? And so that's kind of, you know, why, why it works. Part of that, you know, is instinct. And then Matthew would be like, oh yeah, okay, yes, that, that, that makes sense, that makes sense. And then hanging up all these cards. I mean, Matthew is kind of, Matthew would be bringing his screenwriting idea to it would be like putting up this poster of cards and then sometimes you try it in and in the editing it's like oh you want it to go there but it's just it just doesn't work with the footage so it's always just having to go back to the footage and just try to make it work it's like sewing together a very intricate intricate dress yes, um that's a good, and I I would that's say a really that good parallel. the editing part was probably my 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 filmmaking that's where i think i really learned the most was in the editing and then everything else too the business of it but just the process of editing was 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 tough and it took a lot of you know you have to just get through all those those uh rough cuts and believe that there is a story at the end and it slowly takes shape slowly 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 this the refining and the refining and then you have it at the end Lots of, and in showing it to audiences, or we had test screenings, which was really, really helpful because sometimes where you think an edit makes sense and then people watch it and they're confused and asking questions and you're like, what was it? Oh, it was because we cut away to this little girl yeah. that they think that something happened to her. Okay, we have to remove that and change it to something else. So it's just com continual feedback and refining. Okay. Wow. Very interesting. So aside from uh entertainment production do you have any any other hobbies uh or is entertainment production all consuming or are you perhaps a skydiver or a stamp collector <laughs> <laughs> i've never gone skydiving um no at hobbies i guess like you know uh watching movies matthew and i will go see movies we go out to dinner we talk about the movie um yoga hiking uh kind of i guess getting out there i don't know re reading more okay <laughs> science fiction i you know anything with with science fiction is is always fun but talking movies talking movies with matthew and we always <laughs> order the same food okay <laughs> um so it <laughs> seems it seems to go without saying if you've been involved in in a historic doctor who documentary you must be a doctor who fan um so do you recall the first episodes that you've ever watched and do you have a favorite doctor well i would have to say i mean i remember tom baker from from when i was back in you know the 80s and he was always great but it was um really when i when i was chatting with Matthew and suddenly realized, or he told me that he wrote the eighth doctor and I had no idea because, you know, we'd worked together on his other features okay. and he never mentioned doctor who never really? mentioned it. Um, and 
so that blew my mind and I went and I watched the TV movie. Um, I think I had to watch it on YouTube or something and it was amazing. Mm -hmm. So I guess like Paul McGann was my gateway back into it. You know, thank you, Matthew. Um, <laughs> for, many, for, for the TV movie and then uh, the, the years afterwards to make the documentary. Yeah. But um, so well, Paul McGann, you definitely a favorite and uh and then rose I, so i feel like it was kind of like little bits that that drew me in uh okay. to the show so you know eccleston i love capaldi love capaldi yeah. too so right and you like you like them all they all bring something they all bring exactly to it yeah e each each of them creates a unique era i think that's right yes yeah um okay so uh, switching over to, uh, wasn't there somebody else that was in, oh, Mr. Jacobs. Okay, yeah, <laughs> he's, okay, Mr. Jacobs up there to the left. Um, Mr. Jacobs, the opportunity to, to speak with you and briefly interview you is honestly surreal um, because technology has changed so much since 1996. And if someone had told me in the future when, or if someone told me back in 1996 that at some time in the future, you're going to be talking to the writer of this movie on a video phone, I wouldn't have believed it. OK, uh, so um, are you are you a bit uh, surprised in how technology has advanced since the film came out? <laughs> I'm surprised. I, I don't I don't actually think I'm surprised. I mean, OK, I was I mean, um, uh, up until 96, I'd seen technology sort of you know, going along around 96, we were starting to have, you know, emails. We right. were going, you know, we, you know, we, AOL. We AOL. AOL, you know, yes. We were talking earlier. Pay by the minute. Those lovely yeah. noises. Just <laughs> paying by the minute. Good grief. Yeah. So, but I, so I'm not really surprised. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I think in a way I'm delighted by all the technology that's coming. And I think it's like the curve toward going at the speed of light in as much as we're not quite sure when that's ever going to be achieved. I think there's a similar curve that's happening toward with um, artificial intelligence. It's, it's getting closer and closer and closer. You know, we're, we have, we're nowhere near sentience yet, but we're getting we're heading close. Are we nowhere near? Well, there's a very interesting piece in the New York Times about this. Um, just about the, the you know have have has ai reached a level of, of sentience yet and there's also some very interesting stuff out there on the on the chat ais um where you can get a ai to help you um you know write and help you come up with ideas these kind of things are on the horizon and they're very exciting um we're only a short breath away i'm certainly writing about it at the moment um on a project you know with the development of ai and and economics and mm -hmm. those those things are are, fa are truly fascinating so i'm not really surprised is the short answer to your question very interesting didn't ai just pass a harvard entrance exam last week yes the was, chat, yeah. the chat what's it called chat GTP or something, GTP chat or something GTP, like that. yes that's yeah. right Yes, yeah. it did. It passed. Mm -hmm. It didn't do that well, but right. it passed, and mm -hmm. and they were able to see through it. Um, uh, and uh, certainly, it's a fascinating thing to play with. I'm, in fact, probably after we finish this interview, I'm thinking of going and playing with it for the rest of today. I mean, but, um, like mm -hmm. every you think of a job, and you're like, oh, AI is going to replace that even editing like they're editing videos oh, yes. you, like you pick up your phone you're like oh remember your memory from a year ago and then it edits the right. video together yeah. oh mean, god it, that's so haunting isn't it you, you pick up your is. phone and you go and you go oh my gosh there's our trip to london in may um, right. uh, with yeah. with all of those moments there and then it goes too much should i share this with somebody and then you <laughs> right. go uh, no. <laughs> um, and, then, and then it'll pick up you know, a wed that wedding you were at. Yeah. Right. It's, it, it's there's it, technology is is truly wonderful. I mean that's why we like science fiction as well because we're trying to imagine where the next technology technological sort of leap is going to happen. It's exciting. No doubt. 
Okay. Um, I'm, I have that next broad question for you coming up, uh, Mr. Jacobs or, or Matthew about, me, Matthew. about, yeah. okay. Thank you, sir. Thanks, about Chris. who you are. The same question that I, uh, just asked uh, Miss Yule or, I or can Vanessa. Be Vanessa. Just call me okay. Vanessa. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Um, so for watchers and listeners, there's one thing I would suggest uh, to, to if you want to get uh, the most possible out of this interview, um, technology, go to Wikipedia. And that's not new technology. That's been around for quite a long time now. Um, I actually have the, uh, the uh, Wikipedia of Mr. Jacobs right here. And I highly suggest that people watch it. What you may want to do, <laughs> yeah, I have it on paper. And uh, what you may want to do is pause the video now, go to wikipedia.com and type in Matthew Jacobs. He's the first hit and, and it's the correct Matthew Jacobs. And here's some highlights of that. Uh, it says life and career. Uh, Jacobs worked as one of the many writers for George Lucas's the the young indiana jones chronicles i i didn't know that and that's awesome i used to i watched that we probably sat it. next to each other in a starbucks greg because i was living in uh, marin um and really? it's covered yeah it's covered in the documentary you see you see my sons and you see uh, that place we were in you see the the this was a whole life you know and it was courtesy of mr of mr lucas um, and um, he really brought me into America in '92. Yeah. We we might have run into each other. We uh, we also we have a place. Have we have we have a place on Lombard Street, well, which is our our summer home. And really, uh, yeah, yeah, our family's had it since the 1950s. Oh, that's so, um, so we're either over on Lombard Street or uh, or over here in Sausalito. So yeah. it, it's it, we may have bumped shoulders. Um, well, my family is still there. They're still they're still there. Mm -hmm. my, yeah, my my ex wife and my two sons, who you meet in the documentary, you meet all three of them. Yeah, um, I, I saw them in the documentary. They're they're, they're, um, they're very much still in San Francisco and in Marin. Okay. In fact, well, the storage unit that the film opens in um, is in Marin. Oh, are you I'm serious? Not gonna, I'm not going to say exactly where because I don't. Okay, that was yeah that that op <laughs> that opening scene was interesting. I, at first, I thought that you were in a server room because, <laughs> yes. of, because of, it of, looks of like the, that, the corridors. It? Yeah, it, it was kind of, it was, claustro it was claustrophobic, and yes. and so I was kind of glad when you got into the more opened areas. <laughs> yes. But, um, so um, other things that are mentioned in the in in the wiki uh, is that uh, let's see here. Jacobs is perhaps remembered, uh, best remembered for writing and co-producing the 1996 Doctor Who television movie, which featured Paul McGann as the Doctor and Eric Roberts as the Master. As, as we know, um, there's some other interesting facts uh, about uh, Jacobs has also written screenplays. His film credits include Lassie. I watched that, had no idea that I would be speaking with you in the future. Um, the Emperor's New Groove and a cult classic, Paper House. Um, and, and it also mentions work on video games such as Outlaws, uh, Star Wars, yeah. Starfighter. And then uh, that interesting fact of Jacob's father, the actor Anthony Jacobs, uh, appeared in the Doctor Who serial, The Gunfighters, in 1966. And uh, which I've seen that, 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 uh, seen that Western-ish yeah. genre. Western-ish is the word. Yeah, Western-ish so, genre. The Western courtesy of Hampstead, um, London. You know, mm, you're <laughs> right. Everybody's doing their doing their American accent. Uh -huh. yeah. So, um, so that leads us to uh, Mr. Jacobs. Who are you? Um, can you summarize uh, who you are, where you come from, and what you love? I was born in London. Uh, it was a very cold day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it wasn't. Actually, it was July first. So it was. So yeah, I, I come from a family, um, sort of a strange family. My dad was an actor. My mother was a poet. Um, uh, my, my, um, and you, it's covered in the documentary. Um, and um, and then I and then quite young I started acting. After, in fact, visiting the Doctor Who set. The same director Rex Tucker brought me in to do 
a uh, classic serial called Point Counterpoint, which was an adaptation of the Aldous Huxley. And, uh, and I played the part of Little Phil in, in that. And then, and then after that, I was in the National Youth Theatre and um, um, later, a bit later on. And then I went to university and then, oh, then I worked as a runner for Ridley Scott Associates um, in the cutting room um, on commercials. And then I went to university to study drama and directing. And then from there, I went to the National Film School where I started to become a writer um, out of necessity rather than any kind of divine inspiration. Um, it, was, it was like, this was a good way of making a living. Um, and then I did, so I wrote anything that would get made. Um, so the first films, besides the sort of very pretentious sort of film school films that I, I worked on, both for other students and for myself to direct, the first film that really hit the screens was a film called The Ninja Mission, which was a, a, a Swedish ninja movie. It was mm -hmm. 1983, you know, 84. So it was like, if it was going to get made, I, I was there because I realized that's the way you get work. If you've written something um, that has actually been made and goes out and makes money, suddenly you're a horse in a race that is where you've won, or at least you've won in the race. So people okay. start betting on you, as it were. And certainly oh. in Britain, it's a pretty small industry. So I then, get, I then started to do quite well and was writing television. And then I got the opportunity to, to, the opportunity to direct my work, um, which would be great. And I did all sorts of things. And then finally, I, I did a film called Hallelujah Anyhow that played Sundance and got me a reputation here. And I wrote the film for Bernard Rose called Paper House. It was also a cult film. He went on to do Candyman. And, and, and actually Paper House is the first, one of the first scores that Hans Zimmer did. It's worth looking up if you get the chance. It's actually kind of an interesting film. Okay, Hans and, Zimmer, the musician? That's right, yeah. Oh, really? And, yeah, so, um, so he, he did my short and things. So we were all a gang and we were making films and then George Lucas invited me to be on the team for, um, for Young Indiana Jones. And that really brought me to America. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, making all those other things that you, just, that you, um, you know, you described there. Okay. Um, but basically with a family, um, uh, with my two sons and, and Steph, and we lived in Marin, and I would zip up and down to LA, um, uh, having a, you know, basically a, a pretty much a great time through the 90s. And then in the 2000s, there was a sort of a, a, a drift away from the franchise stuff. And I moved to, into teaching around about 2007. And then I met Vanessa in 2009. Okay. The rest is history. Okay. Um, that's, <laughs> how did you guys meet? Well, I was, um, I was a, an instructor, or professor, whatever you like to call it, um, at Academy of Art University. You'd say like to call it a university. Um, <laughs> it is. And, and, they, and they were, um, Vanessa was doing her post-grad um, in, in filmmaking. So, uh, so it, was, it was actually my first semester there. And, um, and uh, it just, we just kind of clicked. Um, you know, some people um, have a similar sense of humor, and I think we have a similar kind of sense of humor. It's kind of dark and a bit, you know, out <laughs> there and things like that. And, and so suddenly you find there's somebody who, 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 yeah, different person, but the same in terms mm -hmm. of how, uh, in terms of how our humor clicks, um, and somebody who I could trust. Okay. Um, which is, I think, the most important thing. I'm incredibly grateful to Vanessa for the amount of time that she has put into um, stuff that we've done together over the years, really. It's a partnership, and it just sort of evolved in a sort of quiet way. Um, and before we know where we are, it's 2023. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're talking about 14 years. Um, wow. And so that's, that is a partnership 
that yeah. becomes um, part of your part of your life. It's a work partnership, um, no. and it's always been a work partnership. That has always been, I think, its saving grace. We just work together, um, and um, and I think those kind of collaborations are few and far between. For me, there's Vanessa, and there's Bernard Rose, um, and somebody will kill me if I missed them. Yeah, and my, and my UK. <laughs> Set yourself up for that one. Yeah, that's right. And my UK agent, um, okay. Stu Rogers, who, who the other day I was meeting a manager here who wanted to take me on. And she sort of said, she said, oh, so you're with, um, you know, independent talent group in London. How long, how long have you been with Sue Rogers? He's a really good agent. And, uh, and I said, 1980, 81. And she just looked and she went, oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because in LA, loyalty is spelled loyalty. Um, it's, it's a, loyalty is not a virtue always. <laughs> um, clients move away from agents. But I've, I've had a tremendous affection for my, my British agent and for the American agents I've had in the past. Um, you, uh, you know, it's it's interesting that you should mention uh, uh, humor as being a bond with your uh, friendship with Vanessa, because earlier she had said that he was the funniest. He's the funniest person <laughs> I've ever met. Well, so, there you go. So I found somebody I, who thinks I'm funny, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> so, OK, so do, do you have any crazy hobbies that nobody knows about are you a skydiver I, or a stamp i think i can talk about I mean, you, you go skydiving oh. like every other weekend don't you yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah that's right and i land very quickly because i'm a little overweight <laughs> so okay. it's like it's like they throw me out of the plane <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm on the ground so. but um, no uh, what hobbies i i like to draw i like to that's what i love to do i love doing little drawings um doodles um it helps me helps me sort of concentrate on stuff, you know. So all the way through, oh. all the way through my, you know, all the notes I'm making at the same time, I'm doing drawings and, and working out visual things. It's a that for me is my hobby. Um, okay. And I, and Vanessa, you do it too. I mean, you're an artist too. You know, you you know. I think there's that's that's that we all have these sort of talents that sometimes add up to the other talents that we do. And if you can find a way of making those talents your hobby, then I think your life is, is, is good. If you can make your hobby your, your work, um, mm -hmm. uh, then, that's a, that's a, then, then you really are blessed. Right. So what, that's that's interesting. So you are both artists, and um, what what do you draw, <laughs> Vanessa? Oh, I mean, I I don't I I do have my little art box that I brought out recently, but I mean, I, I it's interesting. Oh, I don't do it as as as, as Matthew to, does it. No, but I what mean, you there do, have been I can't times do. though. You do graphic art. You oh, together. you're talking about my graphic art. That's yes. true. That's something I've picked up. It's a real skill, you know. Um, uh, we were talking in another interview about how Vanessa had, had incorporated the TARDIS into some ancient, you know, Buddhist scroll. <laughs> um, and Uma Thurman's dad, who's a who's an expert in Buddhism, really loved this, and it, so it looked like the TARDIS is for. It's constantly, you know, when we make an EPK, an electronic press kit. Um, that is actually like Vanessa, a graphic novel. I learned like, so yeah, much about yeah. Photoshop. <laughs> That's right. And no, InDesign. You like... have a patience for that, but I don't. <laughs> I do a doodle. It's interesting to, to see comparisons um, with you guys and some other people um, that I've interviewed, um, because uh, this, this interview series uh, is intended to educate people on common ties, uh, things that things that people have in common, uh, oh, who who have been at six, who are successful, and um, it seems as if uh, many people are multi talented. They're they're not just they're not just good at one thing, and in addition to uh, it seeming as if uh, what people have in common is that they're multi talented. 
it's also that they're doing something that they love. Yes. And there is a saying that in order to, well, I don't know what the saying is. There, There is a theory that in order to be successful, you need to love what you're doing because you're going to be doing it all of the time. Yeah. Would, would you guys doing, do what you love? Yeah. Love yeah, those, those exactly. Kind of, those kind of, I, that doesn't mean that there isn't going to be sort of hard times where you go, oh my God, really? <laughs> I, I can't, mm -hmm. uh, I do not want to write, you know, another episode of this thing. And uh, <laughs> you, know, you drag yourself screaming to the computer. And, um, and then, and then, but, but it is a reward at the end of the day. You say, well, at least I'm enjoying doing this. Right. So, and, and, right. and if you can, if, if you have to do something else to pay the rent, then that's great. You mm -hmm. know, but, but having something that you love to do is such an important part of life. It's yeah. It's like the reminder you could always, you can always go back to that. Yes. Um, I mean, it's just, I guess living in LA, everyone wants to is sort of, it's one of those places where everyone's driven a, a large part of the re, uh, economy is driven by Hollywood and making movies and TVs. Not everyone in LA is for that, but it's such a big integral part of it. And so it's just always like, you know, a bit, is, is it a, maybe it's an uphill thing or you're always tr having to like be creative, do that next thing, get your next gig or whatever else. So it's always nice to have something, whether it's drawing, finding your creative outlet, journaling, writing things down, or even just getting outside just to like mm. go for a yes. walk and enjoy the weather just to clear your mind right. is very kind of important for the creative process to have an outlet. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you and know, I wanted to mention like family um, yes. because like m my brother is also in Los Angeles and I'm just sort of thinking, oh yeah, I guess I do kind of like the visual uh computer graphics kind of getting into that that's not my my main thing but i find it fascinating it's like my brother is a visual uh effects supervisor and he yes, works in tv and does a lot of the marvel tv shows and mm -hmm. so he kind of he studied architecture and he kind of has that creative mind um sort of in the computer world kevin ewell he's can look him up um but yeah he does a lot of the technical post-production blowing things up or creating different worlds but he kind of does that in the digital sort of medium and then matthew you have you know writers in your family and an actor oh yeah my brother is a very good writer um he's just writing a novel now he's writing his first novel um i'm so excited to see how that comes out very interesting. So, so um, multi talents. Now, you know, I have had, uh, I have interviewed um, authors, actors that have mentioned that yeah, they have day jobs, um, and and that the 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 things that they're most interested in, uh, their performing arts, uh, may come as as secondary. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems as if their day jobs also include include something that they love. Yes, um, if they're left so, yeah, that's very interesting. And I think it, we can do that now. I think that's what, sorry to interrupt. I think that's, we can do that now. It's one of the pluses of technology um, is that not only is technology being democratized to the extent whereby you can go out, Greg, and you can make a documentary yourself. You can find mm -hmm. somebody who will, who will, you know, you can work out better for yourself. There's no longer, the economic barrier isn't as large as it used to be. Not only that, now, you know, through the pandemic, we've really, people have realized by being at home that their quality of life um, could, be, could be richer um, mm -hmm. because we get to such a yeah. habit of going to work and then coming back, relaxing, and then going to work, et cetera. And then mm -hmm. what happened during the pandemic was people woke up to the fact that, wait, I can do this, I could do that, mm -hmm. I could do this. And so I think that's generally a slightly different attitude toward, um, you know, how we live our lives as a result of the pandemic, which is, which is kind of interesting. I wonder if that yeah. happened the last time there was a plague. You know, well, maybe that's why the Renaissance, you know, who knows? Maybe. 
Yeah, you know, it, yeah, they didn't have the internet in 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 what, nineteen what they fourteen. When was the Spanish? 19, flu? I think it was nineteen twelve. Nineteen twelve. Yeah, 14. I think I I may be wrong on that, but, no, but well, there was the nineteen eighteen. Yes, there was there was that one. Oh, it was in but then but then there was the bubonic plague. When was the bubonic? Oh, that plague? was in the middle late medieval times. Right, and then you have. The Renaissance. We're going to explain. I'm going to explain <laughs> my ignorance now. Then after that, you have you you have the Renaissance, right? So so what happened? It, it's interesting. What is the relationship between plague and death on a massive scale and creativity um, and uh, rebirth? <laughs> well, you can you'll 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 write the the novel on that one. That's a thesis. <laughs> There is a thesis there, isn't there? There's something. There's something. Baby boomers, I suppose. Whatever. Well, you, you know, the, the pandemic did have a silver line, some silver linings. You know, like Vanessa said, they, you know, back during the Spanish flu, uh, I guess 1918, they didn't have the internet. And one positive thing is that it uh, forced everybody to have to use Zoom. Yeah. So and there and also go. as also as far so it, it's it's bettered communications um, because now everybody knows how to use it and um, it's also bettered the work environment because uh, with people being able, able to work at home they can interact with their families more yes, and and um, and if you have a reason that you need to miss work just. Tell them I got a sore throat. I got to go get a COVID test. That's it. They can't question it anymore. I remember yeah. people used to be forced to go to work when they had the flu. Yeah. No, yeah. no. I, I did it. I did yeah, it. Me too. The whole office was taken out and I was like, I'm sick. Yeah. And I was told you have right. to show up. Exactly. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. 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 So, yeah. It wouldn't happen uh, now. So, um, Matthew, it is common knowledge uh, with fans um, outside of what's uh, revealed in greater detail in Doctor Who Am I, um, that your father, Anthony Jacobs, uh, performed a Doc ho Holiday in the 1996 Doctor Who uh, TV, or 1966 yeah. Doctor Who TV uh, serial, The Gunfighters, which was set in America. Um, it was a William Hartnell story, and you were on the stage at around 10, I believe. Yes. Um and did this inspire you later in life, um, such as around three decades later, uh, when you wrote the American Doctor Who TV you know, movie? I think it did. I think when I was mm -hmm. writing the TV movie, I didn't say to myself, oh, I'm inspired by what Dad did. Um, but he played Dr. Hol Dr. Doc Holliday. Mm -hmm. and, and the Doctor, Doctor Who came to America um, and kind of teams up with Doc Holliday. And I ended up writing a show where the Doctor comes to America and teams up with Dr. Holloway. Oh. Um, yeah, Grace Holloway. So in a way, wow. they're both Doctors. So, so Gunfighters is about two Doctors. And in a way, the TV movie is about wow. two doctors. Very so I didn't even realize I was doing that. Oh. I didn't even realize I was doing that until we, until in the documentary, we do this panel about the gunfighters. Um, and I see the synchronicity um, uh, of that. And, and they're both and, set in America. And they're both, exactly. Yeah. They're both yeah. set in America. There's a lot of similarities. Um, and uh, uh, maybe, you know, this is what happens when you write. Um, Unintentional you, synchronicity. You, yes, when you write, yeah. you end up often, you end up often writing the same story. It's a strange thing. Doesn't matter if you're writing, you know, an adaptation of Hungry Hippos, um, or, or 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 if you're doing King Lear, you kind of end up sort of you know, do, doing the same thing. It's strange. Okay. It's very strange. Huh.